Okay, everybody, so this is a PowerPoint on reading poetry. And since you began reading poetry last week and you are going to continue reading poetry this week, um, this will just give you some helpful hints as you move into beginning to draft your essay number one, which is on poetry of witness. Essay number one is sort of a reader response sort of essay, but that doesn't mean that you can't use some of the more technical aspects that I'll be discussing in order to enhance your paper. All right, so the first question is, what is poetry? And I sort of asked you a bit about what you thought poetry was and how you felt about it in the discussion board for week two. But here we're going to talk in maybe a more technical sense about what makes poetry different from some other types of writing. What are some of the requirements for a piece of writing to be poetry? Um, some of us might think it's something like meter or rhyme, which are two common elements in poetry, but that don't necessarily make it different from prose. And, you know, some prose can contain meter as well, like some people would say James Joyce's writings, especially Ulysses, um, contain meter. And does it have to rhyme to be a, a poem? Figurative language, something like metaphors or synecdoche or all these other different types of language that are used specifically in poetry, those are also used in other types of writing. Um, other times I hear students say that it's an emotional connection, that it's the author's emotions that are being conveyed through the writing and that's what makes it a poem and that that's not necessarily the case in prose. So from one of the textbooks that I use for English 102 sometimes, I thought there was a really useful discussion of what makes poetry different from prose. And the author of that text says, Indeed, one of the qualities we might assign to poetry, or jazz, if we were to attempt a definition, would be its tendency to surprise us, to go beyond or around or under our expectations, to do things with language or music that we hadn't quite counted on. So he compares it to jazz in that it might have emotion, it might have meter, it might have rhyme, but sometimes it surprises us. Come on. Um, so here's a little example of a poem that might not seem quite like your typical poem. It's one of my favorite poems, and it's one of my favorites to use it as an example because it's so small and so seemingly simple, and yet there's so much to it. So it's by William Carlos Williams, who was an Imagist poet, and the Imagists were trying to capture an image um, in as few words as possible, but also making it really rich and descriptive. So Ezra Pound was another famous Imagist, and he had a poem that was only two lines long. Um, and that just captured one really quick image, but language becomes very important in a poem like that. So this one, this is just to say, I have eaten the plums that were in the ice box and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me, they were delicious, so sweet and so cold. So let's go to the next slide to look at some of my suggestions for reading poetry, and we'll take a look at how that poem can be used as an example of some of these things. So two of the things that the author of that textbook suggests when you're reading poetry are paying really close attention to the words themselves, and then reading the poem like prose by separating it into sentences. So when I was just reading that poem right there, I didn't pause at the end of each line. I just read it straight through as if it were prose. Um, and that's what I recommend you do with all of these poems of witness I've given you, because in fact a lot of them are written just like po prose. Like something like Carolyn Forche, her poem, The Colonel, it might seem more like a short story, a very short short story, than it seems like a poem. So I would add that to read a poem effectively, you need to establish some key facts and relationships. The first fact is, who is the speaker? Who's talking in this poem? And to whom is she or he speaking? And for what purpose? And after those key relationships are established, you can focus on more technical aspects of the poem, like tone, form, rhyme, and meter, all of which I'll go over in just a second. Um, so let's go back for a quick second to the William Carlos Williams poem as an example of some of this. So if I were 
approaching this poem like I was going to write about it, I would first start with the question, who is speaking in this poem? I've eaten the plums that were in the ice box and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me, they were delicious, so sweet and so cold. Well, I would say that the speaker is definitely a person, because it's I. Um, and this seems sort of like a little note to me that someone would read left on the refrigerator, right? So it seems also that the relationship between these people is kind of intimate. And this is something that I have in class long discussions with my students about is, are these people just roommates? Are they husband and wife? Well, my theory is that they're definitely in a relationship with each other, whether or not they're husband and wife. So um, I like to think myself that this is a man writing to a woman. And we could go through all of the different evidence for these things. But if I have a man and he's writing to his girlfriend or his wife, and his purpose is to apologize. But then we have to look a little bit closer at the poem to see whether or not that's the only purpose. Um, what about these last four lines, the second little stanza? Now, the first part in itself could be a little note on the refrigerator, right? I've eaten your plums, and you were probably saving them. But then he says, forgive me. So that's his first purpose, is asking for her forgiveness, less than apologizing. He doesn't say he's sorry. He says, forgive me. But then he says they were delicious, so sweet and so cold. Now, what is he doing there? A lot of people would say maybe he's rubbing it in. Maybe his tone is a little more malicious. So those are all things to consider. And actually, there's a lot to talk about in this poem in so few words and something that doesn't even seem really like a poem. So this example of a Shakespeare sonnet gives us something a little different to think about. So, when my love swears that she is made of truth, I do believe her, though I know she lies, that she might think me some untutored youth, unlearned in the world's false subtleties, thus vainly thinking that she thinks me young, although she knows my days are past the best, simply I credit her false speaking tongue, on both sides thus the simple truth suppressed. But wherefore says she not she is unjust, and wherefore say not I that I am old? O oh, love's best habit is in seeming trust, and age in love loves not to have years told. Therefore I lie with her and she with me, and in our faults by lies we flattered be. So, when you look at a poem like this, you can't start right in talking about who's the speaker and stuff like that, maybe. Because first you just got to figure out what it means. And this is one of the really important things about literary analysis, is... I need to do work with this poem, Sonnet 138, just to figure out what it's about before I even get to what it means or what's its significance to me, right? And I have to do that work, and then I probably can't even use much of it in my paper. So this is one of the things about reading over and over again, right? So I suppose I can start from my very first um, line here determining who the speaker is and what the address circuit, which is what that's called, is. So when my love swears that she is made of truth, I do believe her, though I know she lies. So this is a guy talking about maybe his his lover, and he's not talking to her because he's talking about her. So let's try to figure out what this poem is about so we can figure out the meaning. So his love swears that she's truthful, that she's telling the truth. And he believes her, though he knows that she's lying. Okay, so we start out with kind of a funny premise or a paradox. And then he goes on to say that she might think me some untutored youth, unlearned in the world's false subtleties. So he is willing to believe her, though he knows she's lying, that she might think that he is naive. And why he would want to think that? Well, we'll have to keep reading. So thus vainly thinking that she thinks me young. Ah, here we go. He's not young, and he wants this love of his to, th to think that he is young. And so by being naive, it makes him seem young. Although she knows my days are past the best, even though she knows he's not really young. Simply, I credit her false speaking tongue. So, you know, she's a liar. So <laughs> he, um, he chooses to believe her lies so that they're both lying to each other, right? On both sides, thus, the simple truth suppressed. But wherefore says she not she is unjust? But she's not saying she's a liar, and he's not saying he's not old. So they're both just sort of lying by omission. And then he says, oh, love's best habit is in seeming trust, and age in love loves not to have years told. So 
they can't really be together. They can't be in love if he doesn't trust her, and they can't be in love if she's always going around talking about how old he is, right? So th in, the, in a Shakespearean sonnet, part of the form is that there are always these two lines at the end. Um, and these two lines at the end, they often have sort of like a moral of the story feeling. That's not necessarily what they are, but here in this case, he says, therefore I lie with her and she with me. And this has a double meaning, it's a double entendre. To lie with always means to be intimate with in Shakespeare, and it also means they're both lying. They're both not telling the truth. And in our faults by lies we flattered be. So they get to be flattered. This is how their love works. So now that we've figured out what the poem is about, what's actually happening, now we can start to touch the meaning, right? So what is Shakespeare or the speaker or, um, you know, what what is going on here in terms of love? What is this poem saying about love? What is it saying about trust? What is it saying about lies? So those are all the questions that might guide your actual analysis of the poem, right? Because you're not analyzing it when you're just simply figuring out what it's about. And sometimes that's work that has to be done when the language is complicated in a poem. Um, so a little bit more about speaker and addressee. The speaker is the person speaking in the poem. In some poems, the speaker is very specific. In others, it's more difficult to determine the speaker. What you need to be careful of is claiming that the speaker is the poet. So that's our assumption that that's what we want to do, right? Oh, well, duh, the speaker is the poet. Um, usually not. Just like we wouldn't necessarily think if we were reading a novel that the main character was a representation of the author of that novel, we don't want to automatically assume that the speaker in a poem is the poet, unless for some reason we have really good evidence that, in, that that's correct. So you might want to say, if you have evidence that it is a poet, like they're talking about writing poetry, um, you could say it's a, a poet or a poet figure. The addressee is also very specific sometimes. Many of Shakespeare's sonnets, for example, address a lover. They say two lovers, and a lot of people, one's the dark lady of Shakespeare, and then the other is another lover, perhaps a man, that, and a lot of fun, people have a lot of fun going through and figuring out which poem is which and all of that. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day, right? So here it's very obvious, even from the first lines of some of Shakespeare's sonnets, that... Um, that the addressee is somebody very specific. It's someone with whom the speaker is in a relationship. And you can tell that from the very first line in many cases. However, there are also instances where you could say that the addressee is undefined or unknown, and that's in a lot of poems. And sometimes it seems just like the speaker is talking to him or herself, trying to work out some internal problems. So what you want to do after determining the speaker and the addressee is determine their relationship. Also, you want to consider the purpose of the address. For instance, in the Williams poem, perhaps a man is addressing his wife in order to tease and appease her after eating her plums. You can tell a lot about the relationship through the small interaction. And that gives you clues about the purpose of the poem. So even though it's just a small note, once we've figured out the speaker and addressee, Williams through that poem is really telling us something about the nature of intimacy, the nature of love, that it can maybe be cruel as well as being, um, af that affection sometimes has a hint of cruelty. Now you could say that that's what that poem is about, Cert not what it's about, but what it means or how it's significant, and that is something that um, comes just from such a simple little poem. Okay. <laughs> So here's another one where we can look at this, the address circuit. So this is called Still to be Neat by Ben Johnson from 1609. Still to be neat, still to be dressed, as you were going to a feast. Still to be powdered, still perfumed, lady it is to be presumed. Though arts hid causes, causes are not found, all is not sweet, all is not sound. Give me a look, give me a face, that makes simplicity a grace. Robes loosely flowing, hair is free, such sweet neglect more taketh me than all the adulteries of art. They strike mine eyes, but not my heart. So here we've got another lover talking to his beloved, right? And um, what we need to find out is his purpose. And actually, if you go through line by line in this poem, and which you are free to do at your leisure, um, what you can see is that he's telling her that he is tired of her spending all of her time and energy in getting dressed up when in fact it 
is much more important the way that she interacts with him and things like that. So you can take a look at that one. Some forms of poetry have specific address circuits and specific purposes built into their form. So when we think of poetry, we often think of these types of poems that are very formal. Um, ballads, sonnets, um, lyrics, all the things that you may have gone through these types of poetry in, a, in an earlier class in your English career. So for instance, an elegy is a poem that mourns a loss, and a pastoral is a poem written by a fictional shepherd about his lifestyle. These are called stances, and you don't have this textbook that I'm referring to on this PowerPoint, but if you figure out that something's an elegy, if you know about these stances, then it, get, it does some of the work of figuring out the situation of the poem, but it doesn't help you figure out the meaning of the poem or the, or the, real, um, the real heart of the poem, which is how you need to find that through your analysis. Another thing to consider while you're looking at these poems is the tone of the poem. Um, in Williams, is the speaker teasing or taunting or malicious or genuinely apologetic? Det finding out what the poem means sort of depends on you figuring out the tone of the poem. And you do that through looking at the language, um, tone words, emotion words, things like that. So. A speaker's tone can change. It can be teasing and it can turn malicious. And so it's really important to be listening to those things. And this is a good place to mention that sometimes you can hear those things better if you read the poem aloud. And not just once, but a number of times until you feel comfortable with the vocabulary of the poem and the way the poem is laid out on the paper, the way the lines break, and until you can sort of read it with a flow that allows you to hear the tone of the poem. So this is just for fun, and you can take a look at these links if you want, but these are some of the readings of Williams, Carlos Williams' poem on YouTube, and the tone is different in all of them, and maybe we'll take a look at one here if I can get it to come up. But they give an example of how different readers might read tone differently. So here is one coming up now. Maybe we can take a look at. Okay. So with that one, you can see there's sort of a matter-of-fact tone to that, right? There's, you know, I've eaten your plums, well, um, so they they were pretty good, so sweet and so cold, you know. There's a matter-of-factness, there's a little tinge of maliciousness there. Let's take another a look at another one of these. I hope I get the one I want so that we don't have to keep waiting for these to load. But, um, some of these are really different. plums that were in the icebox, and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me, they were delicious, so sweet and so cold. So I always ask my students the tone of that one, and they say, it's creepy. Um, 
Ah, here the it goes again. Books, and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Oops. Um, so, you know, but it's also very seductive, right? I mean, so she's reading a much different kind of tone into the poem. And there's a couple others. One of these is pretty funny because it's a guitar solo interpretation of this is just to say, which is interesting. But definitely that would rely on reading the tone, right, in order to turn it into a musical interpretation. But you can see that that second reading of the poem is presenting a much different interpretation, that there's something about teasing that's an important part of a intimate relationship. And it's a different reading of the poem just through the tone. So that should be something you're looking for as you're looking at these poems. It's very important in, say, um, Sharon Olds' poem, for instance. Sharon Olds is writing about these little boys, and there's some some indication that it's a very light-hearted poem, that it's a sort of funny look at these little boys, but then there's a turn in the tone of that poem in some places where you recognize that, in fact, there's something sort of um, dark about the poem, something really dark or malignant about the poem, that it's sort of a forewarning of something of the future. And without listening to the tone of the poem, you could easily read that as like this light little funny poem. Okay. So this last, I don't know if this is the last thing actually, but the scansion is the practice, art, or skill of scanning lines of poetry looking for aspects of the form. This is probably something that many of you have done in literature classes and middle school or high school. Um, this is where you look for the rhyme scheme and also the meter of the poem. I, I call it a practice art and skill because I think that some people have a natural aptitude for it. Sometimes musicians have a natural aptitude for it. I also think that it's an art in that some critics would disagree with each other on the meter, on what, which syllables were stressed and unstressed in any particular poem. Um, the purpose of it, the purpose of practicing this art of scansion, is that when you start to find patterns in poetry, then you also start to find places in those poems where the pattern that you found is disrupted. So, if you find these places where this pattern is disrupted, where the where it doesn't quite rhyme, where it has a slant rhyme, or where you're going along in iambic pentameter, which is the most common form of meter. Da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da, and all of a sudden it doesn't work. That there's two stressed syllables in a row instead. Then these are places to look at for meaning. Because the thing about poetry is that it's not accidental. Poets that are published and anthologized and read widely are poets who have very carefully constructed their work. They've chosen every word very intentionally. Um, if for some reason they don't rhyme, it's not because they just couldn't think of something that rhymed. They didn't just like throw it together and then they were like, oh, all right, I'll publish it anyway. It's because they've chosen to have a not exact rhyme. And maybe that's for a reason. Maybe it's because I need to take a closer look at the language right there. And most of us understand rhyme. We understand when things rhyme or when they don't because we've been listening to rhyming things, songs and nursery rhymes since we were children. Um, meter is much more complicated. So when you're scanning for meter, you're looking for stressed and unstressed syllables and for the number of syllables per line. The most common form of meter in poetry is iambic pentameter. Iambic pentameter indicates two things about the line of poetry. First, it has five feet or pairs of syllables. So each line in a poem written in iambic pentameter is going to have ten syllables. Each set of two syllables is called a foot. And second, each foot has one stressed syllable followed by one stressed syllable. Fun, right? Um, it's actually really easy for most of us to hear iambic pentameter. Many of Shakespeare's sonnets are written in iambic pentameter, and we tend to read poetry when we read it out loud like we're reading in iambic pentameter. Like I said before, da 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 da. Um, there's lots of other ways of looking at meter. I, if this appeals to you, certainly I can recommend some sources for practicing this. If again, why should you care? What you're looking for when you're about to write a paper 
uh, about a poem is you're looking for something really unique, a unique interpretation of the meaning of the poem. And sometimes a meter or rhyme is a way to get at that unique interpretation. You don't want your interpretation to be the same as every average Joe out there in the world, and so you want to be able to find some in, some in to getting a good, interesting angle on the poem that you're working on. This is another sonnet. I'm not going to give it to you as an example because if you would like to look at it as an example yourself, you're welcome to.